Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing the course Substantive Criminal Law. In today's lesson, we will be talking about punishments and general exceptions to criminal liability. In our previous session also, we discussed the various kinds of punishments that have been prescribed under our substantive criminal law which was earlier the Indian Penal Code and now is the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. So in the previous session we discussed death penalty, the mode of execution of death penalty in our country, what is the rarest of rare doctrine, what are the various aggravating and mitigating factors and then we discussed what is life imprisonment. So in this lesson we will be dealing with the remaining kinds of punishments that have been prescribed under the Bharati and Nyay Sahita. Thereafter we will move on to general exceptions. Now general exceptions is also a very broad topic that is why we will be dealing with general exceptions in two parts. One we will be discussing in this lesson and part two that is the remaining general exceptions we will discuss in the next session. So let us now start from where we had left in the previous session that is let us talk about punishments. So life imprisonment and imprisonment for specified duration, rigorous or simple. Life imprisonment is always meant to be rigorous because life imprisonment is a serious kind of punishment so how can that be simple? There was a leading case in the judgment of Gopal Vinaya Godse versus state of Maharashtra a constitution bench of the Supreme Court held that the sentence of imprisonment for life is not for any definite period and the imprisonment for life must prima facie be treated as imprisonment for the whole or the remaining period of the convict person's natural life. So you see contrary to popular perception life imprisonment does not mean imprisonment for a term of 14 years. It means imprisonment for a convict's remaining period of natural life. Again, in the case of Muhammad Munna versus Union of India and others, the Supreme Court relying on Gopal Vinaya Godse's case reiterated that life imprisonment was to be understood as imprisonment for life subject to the remission powers of the executive. Life imprisonment is not equivalent to imprisonment for 14 years or for 20 years. Now let us talk about the different kinds of imprisonment in addition to life imprisonment that have been prescribed under the substantive criminal law as a punishment. So there are two kinds of punishments, imprisonments more specifically that the BNS prescribes. One is imprisonment. Uh, which is accompanied with rigorous work and other one is imprisonment which is simple in nature. Both these terms of imprisonment are meant for a specific term, the term as was decided by the court. So rigorous imprisonment that is one which is accompanied with hard labor. Offenses of serious nature such as house trespass, giving or fabricating false evidence, with intent to procure conviction of capital offence, these are punishable with rigorous imprisonment for a specified duration. 
during the specified duration, the convicts are made to do hard labor. They are required to break bones, dig earth, they are required to do tasks of agriculture, carpentry, etc. Imposition of hard labor, it is expected to serve as a deterrent on criminal behavior. That is why the accused persons, they are made to feel that see these are prisons, these are not meant as places where you will just come and relax. So, you are supposed to hard work because this is a punishment that has been given to you. So, this is supposed to act as a deterrent so that people they do not repeat this kind of behavior in future. Then there was a judgment relating to rigorous imprisonment that was Sunil Batra versus Delhi administration in which the court ruled that fundamental rights do not flee a person as he enters a prison, although they may suffer shrinkage necessitated by incarceration. Hard labor has to receive a humane meaning. A girl student, a male weakling, who are sentenced to rigorous imprisonment may not be forced to break bones, uh, break stones for 9 hours a day. The prisoners cannot demand soft jobs but may reasonably be assigned congenial jobs. See sense and sympathies they are not enemies of penal asylum. So, although a person is to be put behind the bars, although a person is to be sentenced to rigorous imprisonment for having a deterrent effect so as to prevent that kind of behavior in future, but at the same time we have to be mindful of the human rights of the accused persons also because as was remarked by the judges in Sunil Batra case that is human rights they do not flee a person the moment he enters the prison. He continues to be a human being. So, we have to be mindful of the kind of punishment or the kind of labor that the person has been asked to do depending upon their physical capacity and capabilities. Then is simple imprisonment. So, simple imprisonment means lodging of a person inside the prison with only light duties and such persons are not required to do hard labor. Prisoners who are sentenced to simple imprisonment are given work only on the basis of their request and subject to their physical fitness. Simple imprisonment is imposed for lighter offenses such as wrongful restraint or defamation. So, depending upon the gravity of a crime, a person is to be given imprisonment which could be either simple or rigorous in nature. The next kind of punishment that has been prescribed under the law is forfeiture of property. Forfeiture means the confiscation of specific property belonging to the offender and why is this confiscated? This is confiscated in consequence of some default or offense that might have been committed by such person. The accused whose property is confiscated is not entitled to receive any compensation from the state in lieu of this property which was confiscated from him. Why? Because it is a punishment. It is not that the state is purchasing that property from him. His property is being confiscated. So, once the state is confiscating the property, it is meant to serve a deterrent effect to him. So, this is a punishment for which it is not that he will be entitled to the compensation which the state ordinarily pays. When the state acquires any property, it compensates the person whose property has been taken away. But when property is being forfeited, that is a punishment to the accused person. So, for such punishments, there will be no compensation that the state is going to award to the offender. So, this punishment of forfeiture of property is generally given to people accumulating black money, smugglers and those public officers who have amassed assets disproportionate to their known sources of income. So, people in public who abuse their powers, abuse their authority and who take bribes or indulge in black marketing or who 
amass wealth which is disproportionate to their known sources of income. Then such people they need to be taught a lesson, they have to be punished and for that what the state does in, edit, in addition to punishing them, the property which they have amassed by such wrongful means that is also to be taken away by them, that is also to be forfeited by the state. Section 61 and 62 of the IPC dealing with absolute forfeiture of property were abolished in 1921. Presently, we have a few provisions in the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita wherein an offender is liable to forfeiture of specific property such as sections 154, 155, 203 and section 186 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. There is a judgment, important one. In the case of Shobha Suresh Jumani versus Appellate Tribunal for Feated Property, while disposing of an appeal filed by a woman whose husband's property was ordered to be forfeited under the smugglers and foreign exchange manipulators for Feature of Property Act 1976, the Supreme Court observed that for controlling the cancerous growth of corruption, apart from further deterrent provisions, illegally acquired properties by means of corrupt practices should be forfeited. Sections 61 and 62 of the IPC were deleted by the Amendment Act of 1921, but considering the situation prevailing in the society, it appears that the said provisions are required to be reintroduced so as to have deterrent effect on those who are bent upon accumulation of wealth at the cost of society by misusing their post or power. We hope that the legislature would consider this aspect appropriately. The next kind of punishment after forfeiture of property is fine. Now students, fine may be imposed either with or without imprisonment. So there is a possibility that the accused might be sentenced to imprisonment and in addition to that he might be also asked to submit a fine and the fine it goes to the state and there is also a possibility that it with regard to the uh, what we call as the petty nature of the crime the accused might be let off with mere fine and he might not be imprisoned at all. So in case of petty offences, the only punishment prescribed is fine. Payment of fine brings home the sense of responsibility in a shorter fashion than even shorter terms of imprisonment in some cases. So how do we determine the amount of fine that is to be paid by the offender? According to section 8 clause 1, if the amount of fine is not mentioned in the statute, then the fine may be unlimited but not excessive. Now this term excessive is a very elastic term which is subject to very subjective interpretation. So when we talk about it should not be excessive, so two things have to be seen. One, it should not be excessive as compared to the crime, the gravity of the crime. And second thing, it should not be excessive when we talk about the capacity of the offender to pay. Next, the relevant consideration for fixation of amount would be nature of offence and capacity of the offender to pay. Then how do we decide the sentence that the accused has to undergo in case he does not pay the fine? So for that, what is the provision under the law? Section 8 clause 2 provides for imprisonment in default of payment of fine. This section is applicable where the offence is punishable with imprisonment, with fine, with imprisonment or fine or with fine only. Thus it is clear that this section is not to be applied in cases where offence is punishable with death. According to section 8 clause 3, there is a limit to which the offender may be imprisoned in default of fine and such term shall not exceed one fourth of the term of imprisonment which is the maximum fixed for that offence. 
Thereafter, we have section 8 clause 4 which provides that the imprisonment which the court impo imposes in default of payment of fine may be of any description to which the offender might have been sentenced for the offence. Whenever the fine is paid, the imprisonment in lieu of its default shall terminate forthwith. Now, the important question is, is imprisonment a substitute for fine? See what, if a person has given fine and uh, if he has been awarded fine and he is not able to submit that fine. So, if he is sentenced to imprisonment in lieu of that fine, does that mean that imprisonment is a substitute for that fine or will he still be required to pay that fine? What does the law say? Imprisonment in default of fine does not absolve the accused from his liability to pay the fine. Imprisonment in default of fine is a punishment for non-compliance with the orders of the court and the fine stands unpaid which is recoverable from the offender within 6 years after the passing of his sentence or at any time during his imprisonment. Section 8 clause 7 expressly provides that even the death of the offender shall not discharge his liability to pay fine and the fine would be recovered from his property after his death. The next kind of punishment that our law talks about is a progressive step in the penology which has been incorporated in the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita for the first time in the year 2023 and that is community service. So, community service may be understood as work which the court may order a convict to perform as a form of punishment that benefits the community for which he shall not be entitled to any remuneration. Now, see when it is a form of punishment, there is no question of remuneration. So, if you have been asked to perform certain services as a punishment, that means you are not entitled to claim any remuneration in lieu of such services. This is a form of restorative justice and community service is being seen as an attempt at re-socializing the convict, bringing him back in the social stream. This has been introduced by Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita in a few cases and which are those? 1. In case of non-appearance in response to a proclamation under section 84 of the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sahita. In cases of involvement of public servant in illegal trade which is given under section 202 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. In cases of attempt to commit suicide, to compel or restrain exercise of lawful power of public servant, which is given under section 226 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Theft as a proviso to section 303 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. In cases of misconduct in public by a drunken person, which is given under section 355 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita and also in cases of defamation which is defined under section 356 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. So, you see there are a limited number of offences which are not very serious in nature for which community service has been introduced as a punishment so that a person gets a chance to reform himself by doing acts which would be beneficial to the community. So, it is being touted as a very progressive kind of punishment in which the victim also feels that yes, the offender has been punished and the offender is also not isolated from the society which sometimes what happens when for small crimes or for crimes which are not that grave or that heinous in nature, when we put a person behind bars, his association with hardened criminals, what it does is have a more negative effect on him rather than reforming him. So, when we sentence a person to do community service or when we try a person to uh, try to involve a person back with the society and at the same time the person knows that he is being punished for something wrong that he did. 
So, without isolating the offender, we are re-socializing the offender and at the same time the message is also going out. So, that is a very good kind of punishment that has been now introduced. Then there is another kind of punishment which is a form of imprisonment that has been prescribed as a kind of punishment under the Bharati and Nyaya Sahita and that is solitary confinement. Under section 11 of the BNS, whenever any person is convicted of any offence for which under this code, the court has power to sentence him to rigorous imprisonment. So, be careful. See, solitary confinement can only be given in cases where a person has been sentenced to rigorous imprisonment, not in cases of simple imprisonment. So, what this implies is that solitary confinement is awarded only in cases of grave offences. So, when a person is convicted of an offence for which under this code, the court has power to sentence him to rigorous imprisonment, the court may by its sentence order that the offender shall be kept in solitary confinement for any portion or portions of the imprisonment to which he is sentenced not exceeding three months in the whole according to the following scale that is to say a time not exceeding one month if term of imprisonment shall not exceed six months, a time not exceeding two months if the term of imprisonment shall exceed six months and shall not exceed one year, a time not exceeding three months if the term of imprisonment shall exceed one year. Section 11 empowers the courts to impose solitary confinement on certain categories of hardened criminals in cases of severe crimes. Such people are confined in a separate cell where all their connections to the outer world are severed. See man being a social animal, there is no greater punishment than isolating a man. So, when you put a person behind bars in such situations where he has no contact any uh, at all with any person from the outer world or with other fellow prisoners also, what happens? This is considered as a very, very serious kind of a punishment. There is a judgment. In Munuswami, it was held that solitary confinement is an extreme measure and it is to be rarely invoked in exceptional cases of unparalleled brutality and atrocity because it is so serious in nature. So, we have to be mindful before we award solitary confinement to a person. Man by nature being a social animal, there can be no greater punishment than keeping a human being in isolation from his fellow human beings. Thus, limits have been imposed on solitary confinement under section 12 of the BNS. In executing a sentence of solitary confinement, such confinement shall in no case exceed 14 days at a stretch. Law makes provisions for intervals between the periods of solitary confinement of not less duration than period of such confinement. In cases where the term of imprisonment awarded exceeds 3 months, then the solitary confinement shall not exceed 7 days in any one month of the whole term of imprisonment awarded and that too with intervals between the periods of solitary confinement of not less duration than such periods. Now, let us talk about general principles of criminal liability. We know the objective of criminal law is to punish, to reform, to rehabilitate the offender, but while imposing criminal liability, there are general principles that have to be kept in mind while we impose criminal liability. Why we need to understand these general principles is because after this we move on to general exceptions to criminal liability. So, what are the principles on basis of which liability can be imposed? First, we will talk about that and thereafter we will talk about the exceptions on the basis of which criminal liability can be mitigated. So, first principle of criminal liability is presumption of innocence. In criminal law, what is at stake? The life and liberty of an individual, 
which are very, very vital fundamental rights guaranteed to every individual by the state. So, if we have to arrest a person, if we have to put a person behind bars, if we have to award death penalty to a person, we have to ensure that by no means is any wrong person punished. That is why what the law presumes is innocence on part of the accused person. Because under criminal law, what we believe is that let 99 guilty men go free, one innocent should not be punished. And that is why we presume that an accused is innocent and the burden of proof is on prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused person beyond reasonable doubt. So, first cardinal principle criminal of, uh, of criminal liability is presumption of innocence. We do not proceed on the assumption that an accused is guilty. We proceed on the assumption that the one who has been brought before the court is an innocent person and let the prosecution adduce all evidences and witnesses to prove the guilt of the accused person. It is only when this presumption of innocence is displaced by the prosecution that an accused can be punished. The second principle is burden of proof on prosecution. See the state is very powerful, the police, the prosecution, judiciary these are all agencies of the state. So the almighty state against one single accused, that is why to maintain a balance what does the law say? The burden of proof is on the prosecution. See, the accused need not try to prove his innocence or establish that, see, I was not there or I did not do this crime. If he has any substance in his favor, it is okay. If he has any evidences or witnesses, that is okay. But still, the initial responsibility would always be on the prosecution and it is for the prosecution to collect all evidences, to contact witnesses who can testify against the accused person and then to establish the guilt of the accused person beyond reasonable doubt before the court of law. So, the burden of proof would always be on the prosecution. It is only when the prosecution has initially discharged its responsibility that the burden would shift to the defense. That now the defense can adduce its evidences or the defense can provide any alibi if they have or any other thing if they want to take the benefit of any exception. So, they can prove it before the courts that their case would be covered under any of the exceptions and then in such cases the burden of proof which was initially discharged by the prosecution then the defense can rebut the same. The next principle is guilt of accused to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. So, you see the entire burden of proof is on prosecution and look at the degree of this burden of proof, the way it has to be discharged. It has to be discharged beyond reasonable doubt. That is, it is totally the responsibility of the prosecution to adduce evidences, to collect evidences, to uh, contact witnesses who can come and testify before the courts against the accused persons. So, total burden is on the prosecution and how they have to discharge it beyond reasonable doubt. That is in case even an iota of doubt is left in the minds of the courts that maybe what the prosecution is saying is not 100 percent true, then the benefit of doubt it goes to the accused person and that is the fourth principle that is whenever in doubt the benefit of doubt has to go to the accused person. So, you see what happens the prosecution has to discharge its burden and how does the accused get the benefit of benefit of doubt when either the prosecution fails to discharge its burden to that level that is due to which a doubt remains in the minds of the courts then the benefit goes to the accused person or when the prosecution has proven to the court that what the accused has done is this crime and there is no doubt that yes it is only this accused person who is guilty of this crime and he has to be penalized, then there is an opportunity with the accused person. That is he has to present his own version and create a doubt in the minds of the courts. How can he do that? In two ways. First, 
he needs to present his own version and in which he has to strike at the discrepancies in the prosecution version. If he can do that, he succeeds in creating a doubt in the minds of the courts and he gets the benefit of doubt. Alternatively, what he can do is, if he can present his own side of the story in such a case by presenting evidences and witnesses which uh, lead the court to disbelieve the prosecution version or if he can provide any justification for his conduct, if he can say and he can prove to the courts that his case is covered under either any of the general or specific exceptions applicable to that crime, then in such cases what happens? Again, the accused gets the benefit and benefit of doubt. It means the accused is entitled to either a total exemption or a partial exemption from criminal liability depending upon what the case is. Then there is another principle of criminal law which is ignorance of law is no excuse. See practically speaking it is impossible for anyone, it is impossible for even the greatest of academicians or the jurists to know the entire bulk of law which is there in any given country. But then if we were to allow an accused to take the benefit of this plea that see I was not aware of this law so I should not be punished for the same then what would happen? It would be a very very difficult task for the police and prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused person because then what would happen? In addition to proving the guilt of the accused person we would be saddled with the additional responsibility of proving that this accused has committed this offence without knowledge that this act is an offence. Now that is a task which is impossible to accomplish. Moreover, in the interests of public policy, in the interests of uniformity in the application of law, law is something which has to be uniformly applied. So irrespective of the fact whether an accused knows the law or he does not know the law, if there is a violation of the law, the accused has to be punished for the same. So ignorance of law is no excuse under the law. Then the last principle that we need to know here is criminal law to be applied prospectively. Criminal law can never be applied retrospectively. Now why do we say so? Because see if today an act has not been declared to be a crime by the state. So I cannot be punished for doing that act. If tomorrow the act is declared to be a crime I will know to regulate my conduct in accordance with the law only tomorrow onwards. Anything which I have done prior to the coming of law in force, I cannot be punished for the same. See, many times civil laws, they are applied retrospectively. Why? Because what is at stake is not the life or personal liberty of an individual. But when it comes to criminal laws, what is at stake is the life and personal liberty of an individual and that is why criminal laws are never to be applied retrospectively, they are always prospective in operation. So students, after talking about the general principles of criminal liability, now we move on to the next leg of our syllabus which is chapter 3 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita 2023, the applicability of general exceptions which are given under the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. So the general exceptions given under the IPC or the BNS, they are available in respect of all the offences, penal provisions and illustrations given under the BNS. This is provided under section 3, clause 1. Offences under special or local laws, this is given under section 2, clause 24. Special laws are laws applicable to a particular subject and local laws are laws applicable to a specified part of that country. They are local in operation and that is why they are known as local laws. Now what is the nature of defence which is provided by general exceptions? General exceptions provide total exemption from criminal liability. In case the accused is charged of an offence 
and if the accused can prove before the court that my case is covered under any of the general exceptions that will entitle him to a total exemption from criminal liability that will absolve him of his guilt and the person will be released from custody the person will be acquitted see general exceptions are general in application and they afford a total protection against criminal liability what is the basis for exemption the rationale behind general exceptions is that if someone commits an unlawful act under circumstances which justify his actions or conditions which are excusable then such a person should not be punished under law and should be exempted from criminal liability so these defenses they are generally categorized as excusable and justifiable defenses so when an accused has committed an act so either he should have some excuse for committing that act or justification for committing that act so whenever an accused can prove that although he has committed the crime but he had his reasons like he has some legitimate excuse or he has some reasonable justifications as to why he committed that act then that entitles such person to exemption from criminal liability and coming to the burden of proof on the accused person c burden of proof on prosecution is beyond reasonable doubt whereas burden of proof on the accused is merely discharged on a preponderance of probabilities now what is this term preponderance of probabilities see i am writing it on the screen here preponderance of probabilities what happens the prosecution gives its own version thereafter the defense also gives its own version now what appears to be the more probable version to the court depending upon that see the prosecution has always ready discharged its burden beyond reasonable doubt but when the defense gives its version the defense presents its version in a way that the court is compelled to ponder over the probability of the defense version being true so now what has happened a doubt has been created in the minds of the courts because see the court was already convinced by what the prosecution said and that is why now the accused was given an opportunity to discharge his burden of proof but in discharging his burden the accused is not saddled with the responsibility of the extent that is on the prosecution prosecution has to discharge its burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt but what the accused can do is merely create a doubt in the minds of the courts on a basis of preponderance of probabilities and then the benefit it goes to the accused person so when we are talking about exceptions see there are two kinds of exceptions that are provided under the law there are certain exceptions which are known as general exceptions which are available in respect of all the crimes given under the law and then there are certain exceptions which are in the nature of specific exceptions so specific exceptions they are available only in respect of certain specific offenses so let us talk in detail about these exceptions so what is the difference general exceptions these are general in application and are available in respect of all the offenses given under the ipc or the bns as well as other special and local laws for example all exceptions given under chapter 3 of the bharatiya nyay sanhita such as unsoundness of mind necessity accident now these are exceptions which will be available in respect of any crime that has been committed under the bharatiya nyay sanhita and these general exceptions what is the level of protection that they provide to the accused person so general exceptions they grant total defense against criminal liability that is the accused if he can prove before the courts that is even to the extent of creating a doubt in the minds of the court that his case is covered under any of the general exceptions then the accused is entitled to an acquittal coming to specific exceptions so these are available in respect of specific offenses only and specific exceptions have no applicability regarding any other offense except the specific of specified offense under which they have been mentioned by the legislators for example 
the five exceptions to section 101 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. So, these are specific defenses which are available only where the accused is charged under section 101 that is when the accused is being tried for murder it is only in those cases that the accused can avail the benefit of those five exceptions which are given to given under section 101. Now, what is the level of protection given by those specific defenses? Specific exceptions grant partial exemption from criminal liability. See general exceptions provide a total exemption from criminal liability whereas specific exceptions what they do? They just reduce the criminality slightly. So, instead of the maximum punishment that was prescribed maybe there could be a lesser charge that could be put on the accused person like in cases of culpable homicide and murder. If the accused succeeds in proving that his case is covered under any of the five exceptions appended to section 101 which was earlier section 300 of the IPC, then in such cases the accused is to be convicted not for first degree of culpable homicide which is murder, but only for second degree of culpable homicide that is culpable homicide not amounting to murder. Now, coming again to burden of proof, ordinarily in criminal cases the burden of establishing the guilt of accused beyond reasonable doubt rests on the prosecution. There is a presumption of innocence which operates in favor of every accused person and such presumption has to be displaced by the prosecution by adducing reasonable evidence and witnesses before the court which prove the guilt of accused beyond reasonable doubt. This burden of proof cannot be neutralized even where the accused seeks exemption from criminal liability on the basis of some general or specific exception. The initial burden of proving the involvement of the accused is always to be discharged by the prosecution. If the court feels that there is some plea in favor of the accused which has not been taken up by the accused, it is open to the court to find out the same which would lead to mitigation of the criminal charge. However, once the prosecution proves the involvement of the accused, the burden shifts to the accused to prove the existence of circumstances which bring his case within any of the exceptions given under the code. Section 102 of the Bharatiya Sakshya Adhiniyam 2023 lays down that the burden of proving the existence of circumstances that bring the case of accused within any of the general exceptions given under the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita lies on the accused and the court presumes the absence of such circumstances. Sometimes the accused may fail to establish affirmatively the existence of circumstances which would bring his case within the ambit of general exception and yet the fact and circumstances proved by him while discharging the burden under section 102 of the Bharatiya Sakshya Adhiniyam may be enough to create a reasonable doubt regarding the prosecution version in which case the benefit of doubt would go to the accused person. The burden which rests on the accused to prove the presence of exception is not of the same rigor as that on the prosecution. So, while the prosecution has to discharge its burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt, the accused can discharge the same on a preponderance of probabilities in favor of his plea. So, what is the basis for exemption? See when we talk about general exceptions to criminal liability, a person is seeking exemption from criminal liability, but what is the basis for such exemption? Either an excuse or a justification that is you commit a crime, you know that it is a crime and you have committed a crime. Why did you do that? Do you have an excuse for that? If you do not have an excuse, so how do you justify? You did an act voluntarily, knowingly and it has harmed a person. Do you have any justification? If the answer is yes, then the court will 
entitled you to the benefit of any of the exceptions. Now, what are these excusable offenses and excusable defenses and justifiable defenses? Let us talk about them. Excusable defenses. When an accused has acted under conditions which show that he could not understand the nature or consequences of his actions or where he lacks the required mens rea. What is mens rea? Mens rea is the mental element of a crime. So, when we talk about infants, when we talk about persons suffering from unsoundness of mind, when we talk about persons who are so heavily intoxicated that they are incapable of having the criminal intention which is required to commit a crime. So, then that is a valid excuse for exempting such person from criminal liability. So, what happens that when the accused lacks the required mens rea to constitute a crime, then such person can be excused from criminal liability. Next is justifiable defenses. When a person does an illegal act under circumstances which accord a lawful justification for his actions, then he is to be exempted from criminal liability. Justifiable defenses are sought in cases where the accused had acted voluntarily despite having knowledge of the nature and consequences of his actions. Why? Because he had a valid justification for having acted in that particular manner. Okay. You see that a house is on fire and there are several houses adjoining that one particular house, but there is a hut in between. And in case you demolish that hut, there is a possibility of you preventing that fire from spreading to the adjoining houses. So, when you voluntarily destroy that hut, which is the link between these two houses, you have committed a mischief. But why have you committed this mischief, which was a voluntary act, why you did that? You had a justification, so as to prevent a larger loss of property and life. So, now since you have a valid justification for your act, which was prima facie criminal in nature, the act was criminal, but your act has provided you a valid justification for committing that act and you can now be exempted from criminal liability. So, what are the general defenses which are available under the law? So, the general defenses that the BNS provides are, you can see it on the screen, one is judicial acts, an act which is done by a judicial officer in the discharge of his official duties. When such an act, though criminal in nature, was necessitated by circumstances, so necessity is a general defense, infancy. When it is committed by one who due to immaturity of age and understanding was incapable of understanding the nature or consequences of their actions. Now, that affords an exemption from criminal liability. Then sometimes bona fide communications, communications made in good faith. Involuntary acts, when you were under duress, compelled under an imminent threat of death to do an illegal act. Private defense, when you have defense of consent, the other party had voluntarily consented with total awareness about the nature and consequences, if the party had voluntarily taken that risk. If the accused suffers from unsoundness of mind, if the accused is under the influence of intoxicating substances an intoxicating substance to an extent so as to deprive the person of his understanding and secondly the intoxication should not be voluntary. If it was an accident that is despite taking due care and precaution if still the act was accidental the accused is not to be held guilty. If there is an act which is so trivial it has caused such a slight harm that no person of ordinary sense and calmness would complain then again that means the person is not to be punished and when the act was committed under a mistaken impression as to existence of facts. It is only mistake of fact which is a valid defense under the law, mistake of law, ignorance of law is never a excuse. Now let us talk about these exceptions in detail. Firstly, we will talk about mistake. Students, how can mistake be a defense? So, for that we need to understand what is mistake that law is talking about. 
mistake means innocent error. So, you see although it was an error, but that was an innocent error. It does not imply mere forgetfulness, but also an unconscious ignorance. Mistake is a slip made, not by d design. It was not a planned thing, but it is something which just happened by mischance. In mistake, there is an intentional act or an intentional omission owing to some misplaced confidence or misunderstanding of the truth that leads to some unintended or unknown erroneous consequences. See, ignorance is different from mistake. A mistake is the consequence of ignorance. In ignorance, there is opinion. In mistake, knowledge may or may not be there, but the conclusion drawn is erroneous. So, despite having the knowledge, somehow the person miscalculates and the conclusion that they draw is wrongful. Russell in his classic work on crimes explains that when a person is ignorant of the existence of relevant facts or mistaken as to them, his conduct may produce harmful results which he neither intended nor foresaw. In such cases, mistake of fact can be admitted as a defense provided. What are the conditions? Had the state of things believed to exist actually existed, then he would have been justified in his act. Secondly, the mistake must be reasonable and thirdly, the mistake must relate to fact and not to law. See what happened in a case, there was an army camp in a forest and there were some secret military exercises that were being conducted in that forest. Now, the villagers nearby, they did not know that a camp is being conducted by military personnel there and there was a history of wild animals coming out on the prowl after sunset. So, what happened? A villager who was crossing that jungle on his motorcycle, at night he saw two lights gleaming at a distance and staring at him. So, this person he got scared. He thought that maybe these are the eyes of some wild animals and unless and I until I do something in order to protect myself against this animal, this animal will pounce on me and kill me. So, this person who used to carry a pistol with him for his defense, he took out his pistol and he fired shots in the direction of those lights. Okay. When he fired those shots, he heard a human cry. When he rushed there, he saw that there was a defense personnel who was out in the forest. He was doing some checking duties at night and he was just safeguarding the camp. So, by mistake, he killed that person. Now, what is to be seen here? See, as per this accused, he was under a mistaken impression as to the facts. Had the facts actually existed the way he thought them to exist. Had it actually been a wild animal, so this person would have been justified in killing that animal to protect himself. So, that is how mistake of fact operates because here he was under a mistaken impression as to existence of fact, not under a mistaken exist, um, impression as to the existence of law. I will give you another example. <clears throat> what happened in a case, a man he wanted to divorce his wife. So, what he did? He prepared the divorce papers, he put his signatures on it, he went to an uh, attorney, he handed over his papers to the lawyer and he said that I want to take divorce from my wife. Saying so, he came back, he went ahead and he married another woman. See, the moment you hand over your papers to a divorce lawyer does not mean that you have got a divorce. You have just started the proceedings. So, what was required was that he should have waited for the case to go before the court. He should have waited for the court to pronounce divorce. Then he should have waited for the appeal period to expire before he could have gone and actually conducted a second marriage. But since he did that without waiting for the decision of the court, what he did was only was not only a mistake of fact because he took the plea that I thought the moment I handed over the papers I had got a divorce. That was a mistake of fact. But here in addition to being a mistake of fact, it also amounted to a 
mistake of law. So that is why this person he could not be given the benefit and he was held guilty of conducting a bigamous marriage. So you see what is excusable under the law is merely a mistake of fact and not a mistake of law. Ignorantia facti excuse it that means ignorance of a fact is an excuse and ignorantia juris non excuse it ignorantia legis neminum excuse it that means ignorance of law is no excuse to a criminal charge or ignorance of law excuses no one. So you see any act done under a mistaken impression of a material fact is excused from liability. Basis for such an exemption is that one who is mistaken about the existence of a fact cannot form the necessary intention required to constitute a crime. Thus, a bona fide belief in the existence of facts where they do not exist would make an act innocent as mens rea would be absent. So, mistake of fact is not available as a defense in the following cases where in case of strict liability offenses and second where the act was not done bona fide. Bona fide means in good faith. So, what is the difference between mistake of fact and mistake of law? A mistake of fact occurs when some existing fact is unknown or some fact is presumed to exist which does not exist in reality. Alternatively, mistake of fact committed in circumstances which show due care and caution was exercised is a complete defense to a criminal charge. Then, mistake of law occurs when a person fully aware of the facts arrives at an erroneous conclusion as to their legal effects or when a person believes that he is doing some legal act which is in fact illegal. Mistake of law is no defense to a criminal charge. So students that will be all for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and I hope you have a clarity as to what amounts to mistake of fact so as to be eligible for exemption from criminal liability and what is a mistake of law which is never an exemption from criminal liability. In the coming lessons we will be discussing about more general exceptions that are available under the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. So this is all for now. Have a good day. Thank you.